As we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, I'd like us all to think about the fact that Jesus sings with us in worship to God the Father. If you'll turn to Psalm 18, please, Psalm 18, and I would also ask for your patience this morning because it's going to take me some time to really build up to that point that Jesus sings with us to God the Father. It's going to take a while to develop that so that it makes sense based on the way the scriptures speak of it. So we're going to spend a good amount of time here in Psalm 18 to start. Psalm 18 was written by King David after God gave him victory over all of his enemies. And if you'll recall, on his rise to kingship, David had a lot of enemies. David had a lot of people giving him problems, not only his own Jewish countrymen like Saul, Absalom, Shimei, and Sheba, but he was also constantly fighting foreigners, people referred to as the nations or the Gentiles in Scripture. For instance, he fought against the Philistines, against Moab and Edom, against the Arameans, against the Amalekites, against Gentile kings like Hadad-Ezer and Toai. This psalm is all about David thanking God for delivering all of his enemies, especially his Gentile enemies, into his hands. Now, I'll explain more about how we can make messianic applications in the Psalms this morning in Bible class. But I want you to see for now that there is a clear parallel between David's situation in Psalm 18 and Jesus's situation against his enemies. Jesus was also God's anointed one, his king, attacked on all sides by his enemies, not just by his own Jewish countrymen, but ultimately in the end by the Gentile Romans. So let's see how Psalm 18 applies in David's life and in Jesus' life. Verses 1 through 3, he says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Let's just note that Jesus had the same attitude toward his father that David had. Jesus, too, loved the Lord and relied upon him for salvation from all of his enemies. Verses 4 through 6, The cords of death encompassed me, and the torrents of ungodliness terrified me. The cords of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry for help before him came into his ears. When David was surrounded by all of his enemies and under complete distress, he calls out to God and God hears his prayer. Can you picture this applying to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his death? Jesus, too, was encompassed by the cords of death. And in great distress, he fell on his knees, sweating great drops of blood, crying out to God, let this cup pass from me. And even when Jesus was put on the cross, literally dying on the cross, he still cried out to God. Now, verses 7 through 15, we won't look at this whole section, but look at verse 7. After God hears the prayer of David, it says, Then the earth shook, and it quaked, and the foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaken, because God was angry. This section from 7 through 15 is a poetic description of how God took action in David's favor. He intervened on David's behalf to save him from his enemies, because God was furious that people had treated his anointed one as an enemy. I realize this is poetic in David's case, but after Jesus died on the cross, I can't help but think about how the earth literally shook and the rocks split apart literally. And I wonder how angry God must have been to see his son killed on a cross. But here's the good news. Verse 16, he sent from on high He took me 
He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. God rescues David because he delights in him. David was committed to serving God, committed to keeping God's way, to keeping his hands clean morally. How much more would God delight in his son Jesus, who had perfectly clean hands morally? Verses 25 through 27, he praises God for being kind to the righteous and for repaying the wicked for their wickedness. And he expresses confidence that through God, he can do anything. And I love verse 29. He says, by you, God, I can run upon a troop. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. Now he's being figurative here, of course, to make a point. But if it's impressive for David to figuratively leap over a wall, how much more impressive is it for Jesus to leap out of a grave? In verse 30 through 36, this section, he praises God for giving him the strength he needed to defeat his enemies. And then in the next section, David talks about his military victory. We pick up in verse 37. He says, I pursued my enemies and overtook them, and I did not turn back until they were consumed. I shattered them so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. For you have girded me with strength for battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also made my enemies turn their backs to me, and I destroyed those who hated me. They cried for help, but there was none to save, even to the Lord. But he did not answer them. Then I beat them fine as the dust before the wind. I emptied them out as the mire of the streets. Now, in David's life, he's using figurative language to describe something very literal in that he literally pursued his enemies and destroyed the people who rose up against him in literal military battles. But this is true of Jesus just in a spiritual sense. That when he died on a cross and rose from the grave, he dealt a death blow to Satan. And as the Apostle Paul said in Colossians 2.15, God disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, making a public display of them having triumphed over them through Jesus. Hebrews 2 talks about how Jesus' death rendered powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And sin and death lost their power and their sting when Jesus stomped on the heads of his spiritual enemies, when he stomped on Satan's head on the cross. And now we're starting to get where we're going. Listen to verse 43 through 45. You have delivered me from the contentions of the people. You have placed me as head of the Gentiles or head of the nations, a people whom I have not known serve me. As soon as they hear, they obey me. Foreigners submit to me. Foreigners fade away and come trembling out of their fortresses. King David, because of his great power and military might with the Lord on his side, caused the Gentiles to come trembling out of their hiding places and to fall on their knees in submission to him. God even placed him, he says, as the head of all the Gentile nations because David was the most dominant king in the world at that time. Verse 49, and here's the verse I really want to emphasize. 49. Therefore, I will give thanks to you among the Gentiles, O Lord, and I will sing praises to your name. Verse 50. He gives great deliverance to his king and shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. As a result of God saving David from his enemies and even putting the Gentiles in subjection to him, David is so joyful that he thanks God and he sings God's praises among the Gentiles. Now, in this context, I don't think the Gentiles would be happy to hear about David singing praises to God. They'd likely be filled with bitterness toward David and even bitterness toward 
his God because they were a defeated people. You know what it said earlier, they came out of the caves and fell down in submission to him. That wasn't a happy uh, voluntary sort of submission. That was, hey, we kind of have to submit to David or we're going to die. We're just doing it for survival to save our own skin. They knew they were forced to obey him. So in this context, David sings God's praises in spite of his Gentile enemies. Now let's turn to Romans 15. Romans 15. In Rome at the time, the Jewish and Gentile Christians were not getting along. For centuries, Jews and Gentiles were at odds with one another. In fact, Psalm 18 is a great example of the animosity uh, that has kind of always existed between Jews and Gentiles and the hatred between them. Yet now in Christ, Jews and Gentiles are not only supposed to get along, they're supposed to love one another, and they're supposed to sing together in psalm to God. It's hard to imagine how astounding that would be in the first century world to find Jews and Gentiles singing and praising God together in unity and in harmony. In Romans, their cultural and religious baggage was creating barriers between them. The Jews were trying to bind the regulations of the law of Moses on the Gentiles, things like you have to eat certain foods according to the law, and you have to not eat certain foods according to the law, and you have to keep certain days of the year holy. And then the Gentiles were mocking the Jews for thinking that those things had any importance whatsoever. So the Apostle Paul urges them to respect each other's consciences and to do whatever they could to not cause their brethren to stumble in sin, but instead to build each other up. And so in Romans 1, listen to how he starts this, or excuse me, Romans 15, Romans 15, verse 1. He says, now we who are strong, strong there means strong in, in conscience, those that are more emboldened to do certain things uh, that are matters of opinion. He said, those with strong consciences ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So he explains their need to set aside their own pleasure and personal preferences for the sake of their brethren, because that's what Jesus did for them. He was willing to bear reproach for the sake of their salvation. And in verses 5 and 6, he says, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting that Paul's ultimate motivation for Jews and Gentiles getting along is not just for the sake of peace. It's so that their unity can bring them together to glorify God. That is Paul's goal here. Because of what Jesus had done, both Jews and Gentiles can both glorify God together with one voice. Now, I'm not sure that Paul is limiting this verse to singing. There are more than one way to glorify God with our voice. There is more than one way to glorify God with our voices than just singing. We can pray to God together, unite our voices that way. We can also unite our voices in the way that we talk about God in our, in our conversations with one another. We speak about God with the same sort of love and admiration. I think that's also what Paul has in mind. But certainly, one of the greatest ways to glorify God with one voice is to sing together. So that has to be included here. Now verses 7 through 9. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God, for I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. And this is where we've been building up to verse nine. And for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, therefore, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and I will sing to your name. There's our quote from Psalm 1849. 
Paul says in verse 8 and 9 that Jesus had two main goals. One was to fulfill God's promises to the Jews so that they would glorify God. Secondly, to save the Gentiles by showing them mercy so that they could be brought into God's fold and give Him glory as well. And the purpose Jesus had of bringing in the Gentiles to glorify God was prophesied in Psalm 1849. Paul takes what David says and quotes it as if it's coming from Jesus. Jesus says he will sing to God's name among the Gentiles. Now, think about how different the meaning is here under Christ than it was back when David said it. In David's day, he was singing to God in spite of the Gentiles not being happy about it. When he sang to God, it was in the presence of Gentile enemies who cared nothing about God, only in submitting to David just to save their own skin. But in Christ, the Gentiles have still been defeated. Jesus has been made king over them, and they bow their knees to him in submission, but it's for a totally different reason. It's not because Jesus conquered them with a sword. It's because Jesus conquered them with love, mercy, and self-sacrifice to save them so that their hearts were voluntarily moved to come and serve King Jesus and actually join in praise to God with him. Jesus sings to God in celebration that he has had victory over his enemies, but instead of singing In spite of his Gentile enemies who aren't happy about it, he sings with the Gentiles who are also filled with joy and who are no longer his enemies. He sings with us. And just briefly, Paul takes his argument further by quoting other prophecies in a similar vein in verse 10. Again, he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. He quotes Deuteronomy 32 where the Gentiles are rejoicing with the Jews because they too are now considered God's chosen people. It was prophesied that Jews and Gentiles would be united together under Christ. In verse 11, again, praise the Lord all you Gentiles and let all the peoples praise him. He quotes Psalm 117 where the Gentiles praise God all on their own for what he has done for them. Now I need to be clear here. I'm not sure the point of Psalm 1849 is to teach us that Jesus literally sings to God with us when we sing together as a church. I I think that's a wonderful thought, and maybe there is some sense in which he does, kind of like he spiritually partakes of the Lord's Supper uh, with us. Perhaps there's some sense in which that is the case. But the main point here is that we as Gentiles get to share in the joy of Jesus being made our victorious king. We as Gentiles get to share in singing to the same God who made Jesus our victorious King. Jesus sings to God the Father with us because He, the Father, saved Jesus from His enemies and in the very process also saved us from ours. To really bring this home, here's the question I want us to consider. Why does Jesus sing here in Romans 15.9? Part of it, yes, is that he's singing for joy because God delivered him from his enemies like he delivered David. But before we partake of the Lord's Supper, let's not miss the deeper reason that Jesus sings here because his enemies have now become his brethren. Because of his sacrifice, we who used to be his enemies can now join him in song to this great God. Who saved us. We asked ourselves last week, why do we sing? And we answered, because we have a song. And our song is Jesus and His Father. This morning, I'm asking, why does Jesus sing? It's because He has a song too. It's His Father and it's us remember as we partake.